असलाकुम जी हम डॉक्टर साहब का इंतजार कर रहे हैं उनसे फोन पे रहा हो गया है तो इन शो जैसे आते हैं हम इन शुरू करते हैं रियाज अख्तर मेरी आवाज आ रही है आप बिल्कुल बिल्कुल आ रही है बहुत क्लियर आ रही है थैंक यू थैंक यू जी डॉक्टर साहब भी आ गए हैं और मैं जरा डॉक्टर साहब के साथ एक स्क्रीन का चेक कर लू उसके बाद हम इन इसको शुरू करेंगे डॉक्टर साहब सलामकुम डॉक्टर साहब कैन यू हियर मी हेलो जी जी डॉक्टर साहब कैन यू हियर मी जी जी आई कैन हियर यू डॉक्टर साहब थैंक यू जी बहुत शुक्रिया अच्छा ऐसे है कि हम अभी दो तीन मिनट हैं स्टार्ट करने में ट्वेंटी टू की रजिस्ट्रेशन है तकरीबन फिफ्टी परसेंट अटेंडेंस हो जाए तो हम शुरू करते हैं तो अभी इनफॉर्मली है तो आप जरा शेयर स्क्रीन मेरे साथ एक बार चेक कर लें ताकि वी आर श्योर दैट टेक्निकली वी आर ओके I sharing my screen with you. Exit you. Yeah. Excellent, Chief. I have. Uh, I can see your screen very well. Too. It's called. Tera unshare kar de and me. Then, inshallah, ye isko formally shuru kare ham. So, bilkul theek hai, Doctor Sab. That is See. wonderful. We can see it very clearly. We could take any time history analysis. Is ko thora unshare kar de. Thodi der ke liye. Main thora announcements kar dun. Uske baad inshallah fir aap share. Sure, sure. Is there a button? Okay, oh, stop sharing. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. लोग आ रहे हैं जी मुझे बार बार उनको एंटर करना पड़ता है साधिया भी मुझे असिस्ट करती हैं लेकिन फिर भी इतना चली इधर उधर जाती है तो मैं अनाउंसमेंट्स एक ही दफा करना चाहता हूं ताकि बार बार लोग आ जाए नो वरीज डॉक्टर साहब टेक योर टाइम रिजवान आपका क्या हाल है आवाज आ रही है मेरी आपको जी जी बिल्कुल ठीक हो थैंक यू बिल्कुल क्लियर आ रही है अगर किसी साहब या साहिबा को प्रॉब्लम हो यहाँ पे सुनने के लिए या कोई आपको ये टेलीकास्ट लाइव इस वक्त ट्रांसमिट हो रही है फेसबुक पे भी जो हमारा पेज है फेसबुक पे सिविल इंजीनियरिंग सोसाइटी का वहां भी जाके देख सकते हैं सिर्फ यहाँ का वहां का थोड़ा सा तीस से लेके चालीस सेकंड का लैग होता है लेकिन वहां पे भी आ, तो अगर यहाँ कोई प्रॉब्लम होता उधर भी जाके देख सकते हैं ना अभी ही करते हैं ये अभी मैंने फॉर्मली अनाउंसमेंट नहीं की लेकिन उर्दू में फिर अनाउंसमेंट एक दफा कर देता हूँ मैं शुरू में कि जिन हजरात ने कैमरा ऑन नहीं किया अपना तो काइंडली वेब कैम ऑन कर लें 
आपकी हाजिरी जो है वो हम यहीं से देखते हैं कि आप लाइव आते हैं तो हमें पता चलता है कि आप लेक्चर सुन रहे हैं तो काइंडली जिन्होंने नहीं ऑन किया बस अब मैं एक मिनट में अनाउंसमेंट करने लगा हूं और शुरू तो आप लोग प्लीज कैमरा अपना ऑन कर ले <coughs> जी बिस्मिल्लाम असलम एंड गुड आफ्टरनून लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू यू इन लेक्चर नंबर फोर्टी फोर विच इज बींग ऑर्गेनाइज अंडर द ऑस्पिस ऑफ पाकिस्तान सिविल इंजीनियरिंग पाकिस्तान सोसाइटी ऑफ सिविल इंजीनियरिंग दिस लेक्चर इज कंटिन्यूशन ऑफ सीरीज ऑफ लेक्चर दैट पाकिस्तान सोसाइटी ऑफ सिविल इंजीनियरिंग इज प्रेजेंटिंग सिंस ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी for the benefit of young and experienced engineers and our endeavor is to keep our fraternity abreast with advancing knowledge in different disciplines of civil engineering this lecture is being transmitted live on facebook too if anyone has any problem technical problem here in the sound or in the video they can switch over to facebook <coughs> today's topic is time history analysis target spectrum selection of ground motions and other advanced options and our guest speaker today is dr fawad muzaffar now before i introduce the speaker to you it's my duty to let you know what are the rules of this webinar first registered participants for cpd points have to appear live on webcam however for the ladies there is an exception if they wish they can cover their face while appearing live on webcam second during the lecture microphones of all the participants except that of the speaker shall remain in mute position three there will be a question answer session of 20 minutes at the end of the lecture uh doctor saab uh, i just forgot to ask you would you are you more comfortable with questions asking as the lecture as you are delivering the lecture or we have a special 20 minute session uh, at the end so how do you prefer sir i think at the end um you know would be better because uh, in the live telecast it's become difficult like a momentum to chair so okay okay as you feel comfortable no issue so gentlemen as lady and gentlemen as you have heard you will be uh, allowed to ask questions uh, during the 20 minutes uh, session that has been specifically reserved for q and a at the end of the lecture i will make that announcement so at that time you can either type the questions in the text box or you, you will be allowed to ask the questions through your microphone uh <clears throat> the participants on the facebook they have a limitation they have the privilege of asking the questions only by typing the tech in the text box and i will read the questions and then inshallah the speaker will answer it now a very brief introduction of uh, dr saab Uh, today we are very pressed with the time we have some issues uh, of uh, power uh, at at our end so at about uh, 4:30 we might have a complete shut off here so i i would like though we have a standby generating system here power generating system but i would like to finish the lecture around 4:30 or 4:45 thank you so the introduction of dr saab is Dr. Sam did his undergrads with honors from UET Lahore. Then he proceeded to USA Stanford, from where he did his masters in 2006. His undergrad was in 2000, masters 2006, and from the same university, Stanford University, California, USA, he did his PhD. Dr. Fahad is not a stranger for PhD, as he has delivered lectures already from our platform in uh, 2021. and uh, i think ready also 2020 he is an eminent civil engineer well known among the fraternity of civil engineers in pakistan 
he had he has undertaken structural design of transportation and hydraulic structures as a junior engineer working for national engineering services of pakistan which is known as nespark then he assisted numerous courses as teaching assistant at stanford university usa he was selected at as teaching assistant mentor by civil engineering department at Stanford University. He has worked as assistant professor and assistant director of earthquake engineering laboratory at University of Engineering and Technology, Lahore. Then he has served as a general manager of structures at engineering consultancy services of Punjab, where he headed and raised the Engineering section, engineering design section of Infrastructure Development Authority of Punjab, which is commonly known as IDEP. And he worked on engineering design of multiple mega projects in this capacity. He revamped, reorganized, and headed a technical section of IDEP, uh, IDEP and worked on preparation of proposals, costing, and tendering of numerous mega projects of government of Punjab. He has also served as chief of engineering design and infrastructure development board of Punjab. Currently, he's working as a head of a private consultancy engineers. Uh, it's probably a private company. And he's looking after technical, financial, and business aspect of this, uh, aspects of that organization. So this was a very brief uh, uh, introduction of Dr. Sa. Now, Dr. Sam, the floor is your, yours. Please go ahead with your uh, presentation. Thank you. Dr. Tahir Saab, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and I look forward to uh, contributing to this forum. Um, it's, uh, I, uh, if anyone uh, has an issue with uh, sound quality, please do uh, you know, write it on uh, in the message board or something so that we can know. So let's start uh, with our presentation. And, uh, you know, I usually choose topics that I am currently working on because it's really easy to, to talk about those topics. And um, also, uh, they pertain to most of the people uh, who are listening to this because they are of practical nature. So. Can you guys see my screen now? Yes, yeah, Doc, sir. Your okay, screen, the screen is okay. okay. Go ahead, please. Okay, sir. So, um, we're going to talk Doc, about uh, Doc, sir. Doc, sir, know, just a time history analysis. Doc, sir, just a second. I have to make my announcement, please. I, I'm really sorry for that. Yes, uh, in case any technical issue, takes place at my end and I am signed off by any reason. Dr. Riyad Akhtar is here, inshallah, he will take over my responsibilities. Thank you. Okay. So let's start with the topic. Um, today the topic is, is time history analysis of buildings. Uh, this practice is really, uh, you know, done in Pakistan by the engineers, by structural engineers, but it's more common abroad. And I would just wanted to bring out as to why we need to do a time history analysis first, and then just an overview of what we do when we do when we are doing time history analysis. Uh, so, you know, um, let me take this to the presentation mode. Okay, so can you guys see the screen? I think I, you can, right? So, you know, the most dangerous phrase in language is we have always done it this way. And you hear this very often whenever there is a change. Um, and, and, you know, Civil engineering being a very set field, whenever one tries to change something, there is a lot of inertia to it. So um, let's look at what the time history analysis of a building, you know, what are the benefits of it? 
This is one of the projects that I am currently working on. Uh, it's located in Lahore, Kulberg. And, and uh, you know, percentage drift is something that we uh, usually take out of our linear analysis. It's uh, non-linear drift that we are mostly interested in, but we, you know, as an approximation uh, in, in a bit to uh, um, bypass all the other complications, we do the linear analysis. And so I just wanted to present to you uh, one of the outputs. This output took um, many days, uh, two days to render. And, and this is how the building center line actually deforms during earthquake. The earthquake is uh, applied as per ASC 716 in both orthogonal directions. And so you see the uh, literal reflection of the building in the X and the Y direction simultaneously. This is happening simultaneously. These are not two different simulations. This is due to one specific earthquake. The building is about 165 feet tall. And each one of those yellow dots is basically a story. And this simulation actually took me um 24 hours on my laptop computer to to simulate we took this simulation out of etabs this is not something that we did uh, that i did on myself by myself this is not a my code that is doing it this is an etab output so you would see the building oscillating about the x and y axis so for me this is very reassuring to have because I can have an equivalent for load force method. I can apply that force and I can sort of approximate as to what my drifts are. But I cannot see, uh, I, I, for me, you know, I need to know, um, I need to see it to believe it. And this actually gives me uh, the tool that, I, that enables me to visualize the drifts. So now let's, you know, for the same building, um, what I did was I did the response history analysis and the response spectrum analysis. And I took out the results of industry drift uh, for a response spectrum analysis from ETAPS. And you can see the results of the industry drifts for each story in terms of those black, uh, you know, plus signs and uh, the uh, circles, the red and, and the blue circles. And you can see that whereas for certain directions, uh, you know, specifically the Y direction, the, the comparison looks pretty good. But in the X direction, which is more flexible than the Y direction, uh, you know, the, the response spectrum drifts are much more as compared to the actual time history drifts. And, and this is actually, you know, understandable because you always have to pay a price for simplification. And if you do not engage in complications and if you, if you try to find a way out of those things, then you pay a price. And the result is that you always get results that are more conservative as compared to what they should be. So time history analysis is um, sort of more realistic, uh, at least at the service le level earthquake. Uh, but response spectrum analysis is an approximation, right? So we, uh, the good news is that we remain conservative. The bad news is that if you're dealing with a 40 story building like Orient Tower or something, then response spectrum analysis would probably, you know, you, you would not like to do it for that building because you would like to do, know um, uh, the behavior of that building with more accuracy. And for that response history analysis would be probably a better option. Now, uh, I chose one of the shear walls um, and to, to to see 
the difference and to to seek the difference between uh, the response um and obviously you know it was a shear wall so we are concerned with the major shear um on the left you see uh the results of response spectrum analysis uh and anyone who is familiar with response spectrum analysis would uh, know that all of those base shears uh, all of those story shears in the shear wall let me zoom that in for you guys would be uh, you know the sign would be flipped for design um the center figure shows the shear force of the same shear wall at maximum uh, drift and the right figure shows the shear force in the shear wall at the minimum drift and you see that there is a lot of difference between uh, the, sh the the shear that is come that is um, uh, given by etabs at each story level in the shear wall so for example at the basement at the bottom most level which is the basement second basement level the spawn spectrum analysis gives you 697 kips right whereas the time history analysis gives you 457 kips which is you know good probably um i would say 60% 70% of the uh, response spectrum value but the but the minimum is um, Merely a minus 127 kips. Um, if we move to the uh, first level above the base, which is uh, this level, uh, you know, if you can see my cursor, I don't know if you can do that. Um, let me, which is laser point, okay. Which is this level, okay. This is the first level above my base. My base is uh, above my, and if we compare the results, this is 629 kips of shear uh, in the shear wall. And uh, corresponding to that, I just have a maximum of 264 kips of shear. So there is a lot of difference. Uh, response spectrum is by far very conservative when it comes to uh, evaluating your or a dynamic response uh, of of your um, system, and if if you can and I can you know give these PDFs to uh, Dr. Thayer Saab for uh, dissemination in uh, amongst you, and if you compare the story share by share, um, the story share by um, level by level, you'll see that there's a lot of difference. Now um, let me let's move forward. Um, so again, you know, this is the comparison of axial force in the shear wall. Um, and, and you can see that uh, my, my axial force uh, does not correlate well with the, sh with the response spectrum uh, values, especially at, this, at these levels. Um, so, I just have 177 versus 146 and 16 kips of compression. Why do I say my axial force does not correspond well with the uh, time history analysis? Because what ETABS is going to do, it, it's going to uh, apply 165 kips in tension and it's going to apply 165 in compression. And you don't, you, you lose sense of the signs when you are doing response spectrum analysis. Vis a vis, whereas, I mean, for example, uh, at this level, and if you can see the, my pointer, at this level, um, you know, I just have 127 kips of, of compressive force. And so I would be, if I was designing this same shear wall based on response spectrum analysis, I would be applying 140 kips in tension due to earthquake plus the gravity. And then 140 kips compression plus gravity. If I was designing it with the response spectrum analysis as well. On the other hand, for uh, for my time history analysis, I understand that there will never be a tension in this part of my shear wall 
and therefore I am content with designing it for the maximum compressive force that, that develops in the shear wall at a certain instant. So I would just be designing it for 127 kips of egg, compressive axial force due to earthquake plus the gravity uh, uh, results. So um, with this, let's move to the next, uh, the major uh, moment component of the shear wall. Again, you can see that uh, whereas my time history analysis shows a reversal of curvature of the shear wall uh, in my, at my mid levels, my response spectrum analysis does not indicate any such reversal in curvature, right? Which is the left figure that you see over there. there There is no reversal of curvature anywhere. Any level in my shear wall because my shear wall is really slender, so that's why. Um, another thing to note is that I can see that I don't need a shear wall above to moment, and if we go a slide back to shear, let me is, is minimal above eighth or ninth level, and your time history analysis enables you to see that because you can see uh, what tends to happen with the shear wall is it's instead of taking the load from the structure and and transmitting it to the foundations if the shear wall is long enough or if the shear wall stiffness is large enough it starts to load upper stories and sometimes you know you that doesn't become evident um, uh, if you're doing the response spectrum analysis, because it doesn't show you the be actual behavior, the linear behavior of the of the shear wall. So, if if, you, if you, even if you look at my shear forces, right? I've taken two slides back. You can see that there is no contribution to shear uh, in the last three stories, in the topmost three stories. There's no considerable contribution to shear. Whereas my my response uh, in my second tallest story uh, in second highest story and the and the, and the topmost story, so I can see the behavior of my structure much better with time history analysis, and I can re I can proportion the stiffness of the structure much uh, in, in, with this information in a much more effective way. So these were my conclusions. Okay. Uh, um, I can be wrong, fine, but let's look at a, a reference um, that I came across. It's, uh, you know, Finlay is a name that is very well known. And uh, this is a publication that has been published by the ASCE Press. It's a guide to se seismic load provisions of ASCE 716. And it basically introduces you to every, uh, to all the three methods of, um, of seismic analysis, i.e., you know, equivalent load force method, which is the pseudo static uh, way to analyze uh, the dynamic response of the buildings, then the response spectrum analysis, and then the time history analysis. And one of the things that it does is it starts to compare the results of the three approaches. And it takes a, a certain uh, example, it takes this building. Uh, the building is eight story high. Um, it's around, uh, it's a mid rise. So it's around 87 feet high, 87 feet tall. The plan is pretty symmetric. And uh, uh, you see that, uh, uh, you know, there are moment resistant frames. Yeah. So uh, you see that there are moment resisting frames. Uh, uh, along the perimeter, and then there are frames inside. And so it subjects this building to equivalent load force method, then it does the response spectrum analysis method, and then it does the response history analysis. Note that the building is very symmetric. So it is not asymmetric building, where your um, sort of mode shapes would change uh, 
with the direction of sway of the building. So if, if we, uh, with this uh, building, it basically does a very useful comparison for different um, parameters. On the left, you see a comparison of drifts for the, in the east-west and the north-south direction. The blue bars is the equivalent load force method. The brown bars are the um, response modal response spectrum analysis results, and the green ones are the uh, linear response history results in all of these figures. And one thing is consistently clear from these figures is that if you're doing the equivalent load force method, you're um, you're you're more you're very conservative. The drifts are over predicted at every level of this very, very symmetric building. It's not um, asymmetric building that we're talking about. So if this is doing, uh, if this approach is doing this to a symmetric building, then what would it be doing to a little bit of asymmetry in the, in the plan of the building, you know? Um, and then you, see that in the uh, east-west direction, the, the response history, uh, which is the most accurate of the three um, approaches, it gives you uh, results that are more than the response spectrum uh, results uh, for drifts. So this is now uh, basically if you're using response spectrum analysis to carry out uh, drift Mm, uh, measurements, or if you're using equivalent load force method to carry out drift, you are you are predict over predicting your drifts if you're using ELF, and you are under predicting your drifts if you are resorting to uh, the response spectrum analysis. So let's look at the inelastic beam shears, uh, which is the middle uh, set of figures, uh, with the figures that are along the center of the slide. The response history. Uh, predictions which are more accurate gives you more shear in, in beams as compared to um, uh, your equivalent load force method or response spectrum method. Now, this should be an eye opener, right? We would have been fine with the response spectrum analysis had it consistently over predicted the uh, demands, the force, the, the shear demands in the beams, but it's not doing that. Your more, your response history analysis is telling you that your actual shear in the beams is much more as compared to the response spectrum um, or ELF um, approaches. So similarly, you know, um, uh, if you look at the set of figures, which is in towards the right, the extreme right column, um, they show that the response history analysis, which give, predicts much more axial force in your columns as compared to response spectrum or ELF approaches or equivalent road force approaches. So I've seen people saying, you know, um, uh, that I'm resorting to more complicated or sophisticated approach rather than uh, using ELF. And when they are saying that, you're, they're referring to response spectrum analysis. And in fact, response spectrum analysis is nothing but a statistical combination of modes. And sometimes those modes, you know, when they're combined uh, with the CQC or, or um, uh, other methods or other statistical rules, Sometimes they give you good results, but mm, sometimes they give you bad results and you don't have, no one has studied as to um, how much uh, we are off uh, and when we are off, uh, when, it, when we use the response spectrum analysis. So um, I hope that with this reference, you know, which was, which was um, published by a very reputable and well-established uh, publisher, um, you know, and Finn is a big name. Uh, I, I have raised some eyebrows as to uh, our comfort level with uh, 
the response spectrum or and ELF approaches. So let me give you an overview of how we do the response history analysis. By the way, all of the projects that I'm doing and in my design group, we have shifted um, to response history analysis. We're no longer doing the response spectrum analysis. Maybe to initially proportion the building, yes. But when we are finally, you know, stiffness proportion, uh, proportioning the stiffnesses of the system, we use, always use resort to response um, uh, history analysis. So, um, uh, what are the bases and wh what is the codal justification of using this approach? Well, I uh, refer to section 12.9.2 of ASC 716. Uh, by the way, uh, ASC 716 has been superseded by ASC 722. I did not resort to um, putting those slides in the ASC 716 because the new Pakistan Building Code, which is which was um, you know enforced the, earlier this year, is based on ASC 716. Uh, so in ASC 716, you know uh, section 12.9.2 is. Uh, is from where we draw our just, uh, sort of um, legalization of the approach or, or the whatever, whatever whatever the word is. Uh, and uh, this is the, the, the section that I have uh, in front of you. So what do we do is we, let me give you an overview. Um, the first thing is just like uh, response spectrum analysis, uh, we go and we have to classify the site for seismic design. And as per chapter 20 of ASC 716, we can have a class A, B, C, D, or E, or F, depending on um, different parameter, soil parameters. Most of the designs in Lahore and in Pakistan are class D. Uh, one of the structures that I designed in Islamabad was on class C, uh, site classification. So, but class C uh, in Punjab, and um, probably you're going to encounter class D uh, classifications. The second step is to identify the risk category. Uh, it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on how many uh, people's lives are, are at stake with the structure. Um, and it's not only the people who are living inside the structure, but it's uh, it's the number of people whose sustenance is based on uh, the integrity of the structure. So um, we resort to section 1.5 of the AC 716 for that. Your risk category can be one, two, three, or four um, for common buildings. It's um, risk category two, for hospitals, fire uh, brigades, and and critical uh, infrastructure, it is three. And if you have structures that are um, that store explosives and all that, then it can be four. So step number three is you choose your seismic force resisting system. So if you want to have a dual system, if you want to have SMRF, IMRF. Uh, you want to have bearing wall system and all of that. So this is uh, from table 12.21 in ASC 16. Once you choose your uh, seismic forces system, you are given certain fudge factors. And I call them fudge factors because they are just factors for you to scale your this year and everything. And those fudge factors are your response modification coefficient R, your overstrength factor, Omega and your deflection amplification factor CD. Um, note that not all uh, building systems are permitted in all seismic design categories, um, as as can be seen from the first page of the table. You'll see NP, which is not permitted, and NL is basically no limit. So you. First of all, design your seismic design category, and then you come to this table. Now, site, uh, I think I have missed one step here, uh, um, which is basically uh, after your site classification, you need to um, 
you need to decide your seismic design category which is based on a couple of tables that we'll see a couple of slides ahead i didn't put it um i forgot to put it over here okay so once you have done that and i'm flipping in a second once you have done that um you can you have to choose your target spectrum your target spectrum is your spectrum that is basically used to modify your time history um that you you're going to download from different sources there are three types of target spectrums that um that you can choose uh the one in the code is a uniform hazard spectrum now why why do we call it uniform hazard spectrum because what we do is we develop a, a seismic hazard curve for for a particular location and what seismic hazard curve is is it's a relationship between annual rate of exceedance and a certain uh, spectral acceleration and and from that um the uh, seismic hazard curve for each of these uh, uh spectral acceleration on spectrum or the uniform hazard curve okay um don't worry about what this d aggregation plot uh, uh, looks like and um so the other option is to have uh, to have the conditional mean spectrum which is more realistic because your uniform hazard spectrum is something like it's a it's a it's an upper bound envelope for all the frequencies that might uh arrive at a particular location right and um i was going through a lecture by professor kevin um and he explained it very well he, what he said was uh imagine that there is a basketball player and you have to design a basket right and what basically user uniform hazard curve is is it tells you that if a basketball player comes in and he shoots in uh, for the basket seven times then he's going to basket the ball seven times now the probability of that is really low right um on the other hand the probability is that whenever that basketball player comes in and he shoots for the basket seven times he's going to basket the ball at least two or three times and that is the difference between uniform hazard spectrum which is there in the code and the conditional mean spectrum which is an alternate target spectrum um, i not like to go through the theory of what the conditional mean spectrum and conditional spectrum is because they are really advanced concepts uh, but you can see that um the conditional mean spectrum changes um anchoring period right so for 0.45 second your conditional mean spectrum looks like let me get a pointer your your condition 0.45 seconds for 0.85 seconds your conditional mean spectrum is much lower and for for 2.6 seconds it's, it's even lower by the way you can see a comparison between the user you have where the condition uh, uniform hazard curve is shown by the dashed line note that uh, at the anchoring period the uniform hazard curve and the condition mean spectrum are one i uh, have one i uh, have, have the same ordinate but the conditional mean spectrum is less than the uniform hazard curve at every other ordinate so if you are choosing this uh, conditional mean spectrum for your structure then what you need to do is you will need to uh simulate your structure for three or four of these conditioning periods meaning three or four of the target spectrums um what do we get out of this pain we get uh, the the um, the base shear due to conditioning mean spectrum is always going to be less than the using uniform hazard curve 
and your structure would be actually lighter or more economical as compared to the uniform hazard curve. So the third um, uh, type of target spectrum that you can choose is with conditional spectrum. Um, this is a spectrum where you not only uh, anchor your uh, target at a particular time period, and you not only monitor the uh, mean of all of the time histories that are used um, to simulate the structure, but you also account for the dispersion or statistical um, variation of, of your time histories at each of those time periods. You know, so we are not only concerned with um, this black line, which is the mean of all of the with this dash black line, because we want to have a certain degree of variability of uh, ground motions uh, when we simulate the structure. So don't worry about it, but I just wanted to introduce uh, these two or three concepts to you uh, because more often than not, we think that the uniform hazard spectrum is the only good spectrum that can be used to enable it. So there are three target spectrum. Now, how to build a target spectrum uh, code, code based. Um, section 16, 13.2 of the new Pakistan building code gives you the values of, of S, uh, A at point. Once you look to your, uh, your uh, project site on these maps, you can get the values of S, A, and uh, SS and S1, which is S, A at point 0.2 and S, A at one second. After that, uh, you know, uh, let me, I would like to discuss this, but probably some of, for those of you who understand this, the, there are two things that they left in Pakistan building code, and they have actually put a, a disclaimer in section 16, 13.2.1. Um, starting AC 710, the world moved to maximum direction, maximum consider maximum direction um, for the response spectrum as compared to the uh, geometric mean uh, re uh, representation of bi-directional uh, time histories. And what they did in, in uh, Pakistan building code was that they didn't move to the maximum uh, direction ground motion representation of two orthogonal time histories uh, and they use the old definition. So basically, you know, long story short, what you need to do is you need to multiply all of the factors that you get from these figures by 1.1, which is the conversion factor that they statistically established uh, between the two more years. Why do you need to, need to do that? Because all of your international, uh, your, your AC 716 to which Pakistan the, uh, building code refers to is based on your maximum direction representation of your, uh, and that means that everything in, the, in that code, um, for it to be equivalent to the Pakistan building code, you have to multiply whatever you, get from the Pakistan building code by 1.1, okay? Uh, the second thing is that they have not enforced deterministic caps, uh, which means that if you're near the fault zones, uh, your SA and SS values might be uh, much more than, than they should be. So, um, there are certain things that they left behind in the Pakistan building code, but let me tell you that um, it was really difficult uh, to even come to this point because um, you know there was a lot of inertia uh, from a lot of different quarters, um, and uh, people were wanting to the old. 1997 UBC, which was really under predicting ground motion um, at a lot of locations in Pakistan. 
So, you know, when there are a lot of people in the committees, you have to find a middle way. And this was sort of a middle way we found out. Uh, uh, we gave this to get where we are uh, in Pakistan Building Code 2021. So long story short, once you get the SS and S1, you need to calculate SMS and SM1 by multiplying it with FA and FE. From where do we FA and FE? FA and FE vectors are given in table 1613.2.1 and 1613.2.3. And they actually are um, fact, fudge factors again. Um, to, to incorporate the local geotechnical uh, conditions into account uh, for designing your structure. So you need to know, and you need to know your SS and S1s. And from these tables, you get your FA and FV. And for values in between, for S S1 and SS, you linearly interpolate between the two corresponding values to get these values. So once SMS and SM1 are known, uh, what you, you, you should do is you for your risk category, you can then uh, establish your seismic design category. You know, remember a, a few slides back, I told you that I in, 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 inadvertently put it a number of slides ahead. So this is from where you, you do it. So you have to know your risk category, which was from table 1.5. And then you need to know your um, uh, SDS or uh, SD1. And then you can work out your seismic design category, which is basically the most severe category that you get from either one of the two tables. So once you know that, um, you know, once you have calculated your S from SMS, you can calculate SDAS. Once you have done that, then you can use all sets of the formulas in 11.4.6 to get a response spectrum. This response spectrum is uniform hazard spectrum. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is at every time period, on this spectrum, if I move in the vertical direction and intercept this spectrum, my probability of exceedance of a pendulum at this time period is 2,475 years at every time period. And, and there were really smart people who said that um, this is not possible to have a, um, an earthquake that exceeds this upper bound at all of those time periods simultaneously. And, and, and that's why um, they resorted to then the condition mean spectrum and the condition spectrums. So anyways, this is the codal spectrum. It's uniform hazard spectrum, okay? Um, after you're done with selecting your target spectrum, what you need to do is you need to then resort to ground motion selection modification. There is an outstanding reference. Um, it's a NIST publication. Uh, and it tells you about a lot of different, um, you know, the background. The, it, it does a literature review of all the codes. Then it gives you the background of the different issues that you might face in selecting ground motions. It's by far uh, not trivial to select ground motions. Your response does depend on uh, your um, selection of the ground motions and uh, to be to, to be fair you know the international community the research community uh, is yet to um, objectively um, decide as to which um, time histories are acceptable and which are not um, so they, they, it's, it's a really a, a topic that is up there it's, it has not been um, established um, I, I use three uh, different uh, storage sites uh, to download my ground motion uh, ground motions uh, and to modify them. The first is um, uh, the Berkeley website. Uh, you have to register yourself, and the registration is free. Uh, and after that, you can download. The, you can give your target spectrum, and they will give you time histories that approximately match. Um, your um, 
target spectrum and uh, and then so this is uh, the uh, by far the best website that i have come across all of the um, time histories that are stored here have been processed uh, um, for removal of noise and uh, and and so uh, they're reliable the other um, source that i sometimes use is the Japanese uh, website that is listed here. It's uh, it has a catalog of all of the Japanese motions. Um, the Japanese uh, ground motion histories would be much more representative of uh, of ground histories that our northern areas would face because you know um, if you study uh, you know crustal uh, faults generate um, uh, ground motions that are completely different from uh, subduction zone uh, ground motions and subduction zone ground motions are um, are by far mon monsters as compared to um, crystal fault ground motions so the the first website the peer website will give you the the crystal fault um, ground motions although they are in the process of developing subduction zone uh, ground motion histories Mm, I have been eagerly awaiting uh, that for the last couple of years, um, but this Japanese website would be more representative of the subduction zone uh, ground motion histories, which is more representative of uh, our than areas. Um, you know. Then there is this Italian website, which uh, basically houses all of the European ground motion histories. Um, some of those ground motion histories. I am um, uh, very interesting in terms of the duration and, and, and the energy that we are interested in. So once I have downloaded my ground motion histories from these websites, what I do is um, I look at certain properties of those ground motions. Those properties are called ground motion parameters. Uh, there are three or four types of ground motion parameters. There are amplitude um, ground motion parameters, which is you might have well, mostly you know in news you might have heard the PGA, which is the peak ground acceleration, and and the peak ground acceleration is by no means um, uh, the single most dominant um, ground motion parameter to define its characteristic. Um, there are so many different things that you have to look into. Uh, before you you decide what ground motion history is suitable for your structure uh, so then there is pgv which is a peak ground velocity and pgd which is the peak ground displacement um, basically all of the three quantities are amplitude quantities what they mean is if you have uh, acceleration ground histories uh, and you track the maximum acceleration uh, of a particular ground history and record it then that is a peak ground acceleration of that ground motion. Similarly, if you have integrated the acceleration history and you are um, you know, uh, monitoring the uh, velocity of the ground as a function of time and you record the maximum velocity that is PGV and similarly the PGD. Um, if you're not doing response uh, spectrum matching, which we'll discuss very uh, briefly ahead, then basically um, the other content is very important, the frequency content of your ground motion. There are two types of frequency content. The um, thing is that we monitor the Fourier spectrum, which basically tells you the, uh, the, the frequency breakup of your time history and your response spectrum. Uh, and we engineers are more interested in response spectrum because it directly gives you uh, a measure of response of the structure as compared to the, the Fourier spectrum. Uh, but Fourier spectrum is, in, is interesting if you are doing amplitude modification of your time histories and if you are mm, not uh, basically, uh, resorting to scaling of your of your base here, um, because the, in that case you are uh, applying your ground motion directly to your structure. The third is the bracketed duration, which is basically duration of when there is significant shaking 
uh, of your building and the last is the areas intensity i did not include um, discussion of each of one of these parameters because i would have to much for everyone um so after what after all of that is done the next step is your um, how to then modify your ground motions that you have downloaded and match your target spectrum there are two ways to do that the first is if you uniformly vary the magnitude of your time history so that the response spectrum due to time history is approximately uh, follows your uh, certain target and if you are uh, for example uh, as uh, the code wants you to do 11 pairs of um, ground motions the code wants you to use 11 pairs of ground motion for amplitude scaling so what you do is you scale each one of them at a certain time period that time period basically depends uh, as to which parameter you're interested in usually it is the fundamental time period of the structure you choose that and then you anchor all of your um uh, sort of response spectrum at this value and then you amplitude uh, you scale the amplitude of all the time histories get the mean monitor as to how the mean uh, compares with your target spectrum and that's how you scale uh, all of the ground motions so in this um, mode of um, modification you are uniformly changing the amplitude of your time history um, each one of them uh, with a certain scalar factor but there is a more sophisticated way um in squad response spectrum matching basically there are, are algorithms where you take the time history you modify its frequency content by introducing wavelets uh, and um, and you match your target spectrum so you modify the time history so that the response spectrum due to the time history matches your target spectrum and this is what i do um and i have a matlab code for it um what the code does is basically the blue line that you see is the response spectrum of a uh, time history that i downloaded from a particular website and then uh, the code modified um the uh, time histories and the red one is the match between the black and the uh, between the target and uh, the the modified time history note that i do not i would do as minimal modification to my time history as possible uh, my fundamental time period was around 2.1 second i think in this case and i knew that i would be doing only linear analysis so there would be no elongation of my time period during time uh, during simulation of the structure therefore i uh, the upper bound of my uh, matching i chose it as 2.1 second and that's why you see that the uh, spectrum of my modified time history does not match my target after 2.1 second similarly i um, usually the code tells you that um, 0.1 times t or 0.1 times the fundamental time period of the structure is the upper uh, frequency limit to which you should uh modify your uh ground motions to match the target spectrum and that is what was done in this case so this is from actually a project that i did in istanbul okay and i always uh look at you know you have to decide as to whether uh you keep a certain modified time history or you destroy it um I, the uh, you know, creator of the algorithm was abramson university of washington is a professor at university of washington and somebody asked him as to how many time histories he would discard off uh, when he was doing response spectrum matching and his answer was about 70% i would discard around 50% of those time histories and there are a lot of different things that i look at it one of those things is um i look at the time history before modification and after modification and see as to how much difference is there between the two and whereas it's difficult to see on this slide as to how well the acceleration time history matches 
uh, it does however um, you you will uh, feel comfortable however as to how closely the displacement and velocity time histories match with each other so after that uh, you go into your e tabs um, you go to functions and uh, you go to your define menu uh, functions and there is this time history option uh, you load uh, your time histories into your e tab it will uh, show a good plot of your each one of those time histories here i was loading time histories from an earthquake in italy and then these four time uh, histories are from two different events uh, in California. Uh, note that you have to upload the time histories in the X and Y direction separately. And that's what the, uh, you know, the subscript or at the end of the time histories tell you that the first two time histories are the, those from, a, from an event in central Italy in the X and Y direction. And the last um, four are from California. Um, the final check, as a matter of final check, uh, ETABS would allow you to look at the response spectrum of the time history that you have uploaded um, in, the, in the code. And I always make sure that I look at the response spectrum. Uh, if I've done everything correctly, then the response spectrum of my time history actually uh, should match. Uh, my target spectrum to the extent that I, I was predicting. So this, this is always, you know, this feature serves as a useful check. Um, then we create a load case and we uh, load the, the, uh, the U1 and U2 component of the accelerations at the, at the uh, supports, at the level of the supports. It always applies uh, accelerations at the, at the level of your supports of the structure. And, you know, this is another fudge factor that you see over here, the scale for why are these two different because um, the stiffness of the building in the two orthogonal direction was different and uh, because the code basically holds our hand and it tells us to scale our base shear uh, to, to, to whatever the minimum value you, uh, it has mandated for the response spectrum as well as the ELF uh, equivalent load force method. So all of that sophistication and, and at the end of the day, if you're using the codal procedure, you're fudging everything and you're fudging it upwards to, uh, to match your base shear of the ELF uh, scenario. That's why the scale factors, okay. So uh, this is after that you analyze your structure. And it's, uh, I didn't want to go into the more detail because I wanted to talk to you about some other very, I wanted to motivate a uh, few of very you know, interesting ideas uh, that I, or afterthoughts that I have developed during uh, my exposure. And, and, you know, we structure engineers take pride in being able to predict the behavior with um, a lot of accuracy and and look at the different five factors you know i have introduced you to, to a very complicated concept of time history analysis but what the what is it all for why is it good when i am fudging my um, my response by using the response modification factor R and I, I don't know why this one is showing up but what my point that, uh, that I'm trying to make is you fudge it with modification factor R. You get a certain uh, elastic base here. You divide it by R to, to, to get the inelastic base here. And from where did that factor R come from? Just written the code, right? Um, how valid is it? Well, um, you can have a building, a dual system uh, where your shear walls can be taking 75% of the, 
of your base shear and you will have that same r factor and then you can have the same building where your uh, shear volume will be taking around 15% of the base shear and you will have use the same r factor um, will the ductility of the building be the same no because um, it depends on the nature of the frame uh, and and it depends on the detailing of the shear wall. So then you are using overstrength factor. Then you are uh, multiplying all of your deformations with your um, CD factor to get the inelastic deformation. Then there is this redundancy factor. Then then you are um, scaling your um, your response. You by the neta factor which is basically you're scaling it up to match the elf base here then you are putting an upper limit on the time period as per ac 716 um so you know there's so many things that you're doing and by the time that you end up um, thinking about it you become demotivated about time history analysis but tell you what Time history analysis, if you don't do it, you will never be able to think about the nonlinear time history analysis of your structures, which is the real deal. Uh, if you use the nonlinear time history analysis of your structures, then basically uh, chapter uh, 16 of AC 716 tells you that you can um, get rid of all of those fudge factors and you can apply your um time histories do the non uh, and do the non linear analysis the one thing that chapter 16 won't let you do is it will still enforce that you scale your base shears to match the codal minimum and that for me is a big turn off because you know i don't want to do that uh, if i'm getting rid of all of those fudge factors then i don't want to scale my uh, base years and that is where performance based engineering comes in so um, another common mistake that people when i look at their uh, models and i've reviewed quite a few um, another common mistake that people do is that they would model their foundations in safe and they would model the superstructure in etax and there would be two different models now that is a gross error and, and it's, it's to me you know uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it makes a lot of difference if your building is even moderately high even if you, for a mid rise it makes a lot of difference and um, let's look at some of the things that we have discovered in in ida when i was in ida um, so this is uh, your rock stresses uh, when you have modeled your uh, raft with your superstructure in ETFs 2016, and um, the moments, the maximum moment is 3644 kips, the minimum is 1644 kips. And if we now look at the scenario where we are uh, exporting our uh, reactions to safe and model it in safe, then the same raft, the, the stresses are much lower as compared to the previous case. Now your stresses are only 2,500 and minus 6, 1,700 per foot. Why is it doing it? Because once you have uh, developed a separate model um, for your foundations in safe, uh, the deformations in safe are not going to be the same as the deformations in your superstructure which you have placed on on fixed supports or so you basically are there is no deformation compatibility between your your raft and your superstructure if you are you know, using two different models um, it does make a lot of difference um, in reinforcement in the lower levels uh, for example uh, you know for uh, this is from the integrated model and let me try and zoom it in uh, you can see that the reinforcement levels are 
you know, well above 4.48, 3.51, 4.59, and 2.56 percent in the lower levels. This is with the integrated model. And let me, oops, let me take you to the others scenario where your superstructure was modeled uh, separately. The uh, axial, uh, the longitudinal reinforcement is much less in this case. So you're, that's, why is it? Because you're not, you're not modeling, um, you're not modeling uh, um, deformation compatibility between your raft and your superstructure. The second thing that I wanted to talk to you about is nudged on the top of the slide, uh, number 40. So I have received quite a few uh, ETS models where um, you have crack, you have assigned crack section moduli and you have designed your building that always tends to under predict the moments in beams and slabs. Uh, why is that? Because as per um, the code, as per the ACI code, your uh, flexible stiffnesses are reduced in beams to 35% of their gross uh, and they're reduced to 70% of their gross values in columns. So um, if you, you know, the, here's the question. If you have just built a structure and it has never been subjected to an earthquake, uh, um, do you think your beams are uh, the second modulus of inertia or the, the flexural um, uh, stiffness of your beams is 35% is of their gross values? I don't think so. I think their beams are pretty much uncracked. Um, and and you need to understand this uh, that the structure you know goes through a, uh, a uh, has a history to it, and we need to consider carefully about it because what we do in our practice is we develop two different models, uh, or we use the stage construction to to have the two different cycle, uh, phases in the, uh, of cycles in the structure. In the first um, phase or in the first model, we use uncracked properties and we get the moments in the beams and the stabs and the columns and we design it for that. And then we crack those um, components and then we get the moments in the beams and the columns again. Uh, so, you see that um, you know the reinforcement in your structure should be the more critical of scenario of the two rather than just using the uncracked or the cracked section moduli to simulate your um, force demands in your structure. So these are the two things that, that I um, wanted to talk to you about. I understand that um, you know a uh, lot of the things that I talked in this lecture would be really would really seem complicated for you guys. But I just wanted to introduce to you a new concept um, or, or open your horizons uh, to different um, state-of-the-art things that do, uh, that are um, office practice in uh, abroad. So with this, uh, Dr. Um, the floor is open for questions if anyone wants to. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fawad. It was really a very interesting and informative uh, lecture. And that used to be my subject also when I was studying uh, in my, when I was doing my master's in uh, USA, structural dynamics. And my professor was Haluk Octon, who was considered to be an expert at that time on this response spectrum analysis. Anyhow, gentlemen, uh, uh, lady and gentlemen, we are now with uh, uh, at the end of the lecture. Now, if you have any questions, the floor is open. Please raise your hands, those who want to speak uh, on the microphone, and uh, I will give you the chance.
Thank you. Rizwan, I think probably if you have to say anything, then uh, maybe the questions will start coming in. If you have anything to say, please go ahead. Imran Saab, if you have a question, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Yeah. I have a question, Dr. Fawad, that in your slide number 33, you showed that you are making a load case in both directions in which you have applied the earthquake. So, I was thinking that in one load case, we can do both in both directions or in both directions, or in both directions, or in both directions, or in both directions. I mean, I don't understand that it is possible that in both directions, अर्थक्वेक आ रहा हो एक ही वक्त में तो इसको काइंडली आप अगर एक्सप्लेन कर दें ओके सो इसमें आ ओके किधर आते हैं हाँ आ गया ठीक है ठीक है तो क्या नहीं कहाँ से शिफ्ट करें मार्ग उस पर चाहे ओके आई थिंक सो इमरान दिस इज़ एस पर कोड दोनों डायरेक्शन के अंदर अर्थक्वेक नहीं होता यू माइंडर अर्थक्वेक इन इन टू हॉरिज़न्टल डायरेक्शंस एंड अ वर्टिकल डायरेक्शन now your building can be oriented in any arbitrary direction to the passing waves, right? So earthquake always is, is never in the one direction. Earthquake is always occurring in uh, the complete description of earthquake is, will require at least two directions, okay? And uh, so our assumption is that whenever the earthquake hits the building, number one, the building can be arbitrary, the principal axis of the building can be arbitrarily oriented to the direction of passing waves. And uh, therefore we don't bother too much with the which direction is which and, uh, and which direction is not. Uh, the, second, the second thing is that um, earthquake always happens in two directions, always. It is never the case your 100%, 30% rule that you apply uh, for um, response spectrum analysis in approximate. It is no basis. It is based on. Uh, it is based on. The, it is. It is based on uh, um, uh, statistical study of a number of earthquakes where they realize that the response is uh, probably you know 100%, 30% of whatever you're getting, but uh, when you do using time history analysis, you have to take forces, you have to take acceleration ground histories in two orthogonal directions, and you have to apply it simultaneously to your building. Because this is what the nature of the problem is. This is nature of physics. Uh, answer you. We have a question on Facebook uh, that I will read, Doxa, and then you please answer it. This is G. Mr. Shafiqur Rahman. He is asking how how do you how do you model building substructures with basement wall interaction as specified by different codes? There are different codes. There are four methods. So, did you understand the question, Doctor? Yes, yes, I, I I do. Um, I would definitely like to. Uh, build a dashboard model with the springs and everything um but 
पाकिस्तान के अंदर मैं ये इसलिए नहीं कर सका हूँ कि टाइम दैट इज गिवन टू अस फॉर डिजाइन इज सो लेस यू नो वी हैव टू कम्प्लीट द डिजाइन इन मंथ और सो एंड दैट काइंड ऑफ एनालिसिस रिक्वायर्स टू थिंग्स नंबर वन इट रिक्वायर्स रियल गुड कंप्यूटेशनल रिसोर्स विच इज अ डेस्कटॉप दैट इज रियली एबल टू डू इट एंड द सेकेंड इज यू हैव टू हैव इलेक्ट्रिसिटी फॉर एटलीस्ट ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स कंटिन्यूसली to for that system to remain switched on and and run the code and the third thing is that um you you need time and um, so usually you know um i would uh, go to the solid structure uh, interaction chapter in chap in ac 716 where it just gives you some factors for um embedment and um, base lab averaging and uh, um and and uh, and things like that um to to i just take the point 90% that it allows um that uh, it allows for reduction uh in the base year from that chapter and um, there have been a number of nist publications on this topic um and they have actually sort of recommended the dashpot model but at the same time you know assuming that the your geotechnical brothers uh would be advanced enough to come up with the different properties of the soil uh that are required for such an analysis um they they have uh, sort of uh, condoned the use of uh, uh sort of uh uh model with with the basements on on rigid um uh, nodes so that's what i do uh, okay uh, doctor uh, uh mr shafiqur rahman who's on facebook he has asked another question and that is that is stiffness modification factors for basement walls and shear walls kindly explain the um, stiffness modification factor should not be applied to the to the basement walls which are the retaining walls and the reason being that um there is not uh, in the basement floors you have you don't have that amount of lateral drift to cause cracking in the walls um there are a lot of things that are happening in the basement your basement is basically surrounded by soil on all four sides and um, you know it's well uh, embedded into the soil and also there is the, the length of the wall is so much that it doesn't affect um the lateral um uh, drift of the structure uh, the, the deterioration of uh, stiffness of the walls with the lateral drift so um Uh, in my opinion i would never use uh, stiffness modification factors for the retaining walls uh, for a typical scenario uh, if the retaining walls are uh, probably some sort of not uh, or or they're significantly loaded then that is a different scenario but typically you know the retaining walls are not significantly loaded uh, so number one for the shear wall um i refer you to the ac 4117 um the commentary in ac 4117 and we are very content with using the 35% um stiffness modification for flexural stiffness um that let me tell you something we are wrong to assume 35% or whatever is i don't remember ac i quote in the whatever is written uh, because uh what ac 4117 and and i think nice or nist publications tells us is that the actual uh, stiffness of damaged retaining uh, shear walls is much more than that and it recommends as much as 70 to 80% of the gross values uh, and that makes a lot of difference because if you are using 35% as uh, the shear uh, modification uh, uh, as as the flexural stiffness modification of your walls um then uh, you are under predicting your shear in the walls and 
whereas you would be designing it for a less amount of uh, lateral um, force. And, and that is something that we need to look into. Um, so these are my two cents on, on uh, stiffness modifiers. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Saab. Shafiq Rahman, I hope you have got your answer. Dr. Saab has answered your question in much detail. So still, if you need any clarification, but if there is any other question, you can type. Dr. Sir, I would I would like to actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask Rizwan Saab about his opinion on this. Um, you know, uh, the stiffest modification of the retaining wall, walls versus the shear walls. If you, yeah, if yeah, I, was, I was I was I was coming to Rizwan, uh, but I was waiting for that few more questions come and then sure. Uh, sure. he can answer all uh, all the questions at one time. Anyhow, we don't uh, any more questions, Ji, so that. Uh, uh, I can ask Ritwan to also make some comment. If you have any more questions, anyone has a question, he can raise his hand. And uh, Ritwan, I think, Dr. Uh, one clarification. <laughs> I am not a PhD. I have done simple masters. So I'm, I'm just a man. I did not do my PhD. Sir, you didn't do your work at Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Rizwan, Chile. Rizwan, please go ahead. My idea is that this retaining wall that Dr. Shab has talked about, it's the square nature of their length is very high and the height is very low. That's why it won't be flexural cracking. Because in which plane they are loaded and on their major axis, because they are momentary cracking, तो उसका मोमेंट ऑफ नर्शिया इतना ज्यादा होगा कि ये आ, हम इसको क्रैक मोमेंट ऑफ नर्शिया या अफेक्टिव मोमेंट ऑफ नर्शिया के करीब नहीं समझेंगे अगर हम इसको कंट्रास्ट करें एक ऐसी शेयर वॉल से जो कि 20 फुट लंबी है 8 इंच चौड़ी है और वो जा रही है पूरी स्टोरी हाइट तो वो सिग्निफिकेंटली क्रैक हो जाएगी तो इसका स्क्वैट होना मेरे ख्याल में बुनियादी دلیل है ये कहने की कि इसको अफेक्टिव मोमेंट ऑफ नर्शिया यूज नहीं करना चाहिए जहां तक सोइल की प्रेजेंस का ताल्लुक है वो मैं इतना श्योर नहीं हूं क्योंकि ये अपने प्लेन में लोड हो रही है इसका जो मेजर एक्सिस है वो सोइल के अक्रॉस है क्योंकि ये इट्स नॉट पुशिंग अगेंस्ट द सोइल और ये हर तरह से सराउंडेड भी नहीं है इसके अंदर की साइड खाली है और बाहर वाली साइड पर सोइल है तो जब ये धकेलेगी सोइल के अगेंस्ट तभी इसको फोर्स आएगी ये मेरी राय है हो सकता है ये बात पूरी तरह से डॉक्टर साहब क्या सोचते हैं इसके सर आई एक्चुअली हैव हैड सम टाइम सो आई वेंट थ्रू लिटरेचर इन दिस एंड दे हैव साइटेड टू रीजंस कि जी इसकी इन प्लेन शेयर भी इतना इफेक्ट नहीं करती एंड दो रीजंस आर सबसे पहले तो the parallel friction stresses that these walls generate if we tend to deform uh, the basement. So the the you know the soil that is bearing on the so on the retaining walls will not allow that to happen readily. It will it will eventually happen, but not readily. And जो दूसरी चीज़ है वो जो the wall that is uh, orthogonal to these uh, two walls that are uh, sort of loaded in the plane uh, would have uh, resistance from the soil that is in front of it. So yes. what what they say is that this is a sort of a very complicated phenomena, uh, and uh, soil structure interaction needs to be studied in more detail. And probably it's a very good topic for a PhD for someone. नहीं डॉक्टर साहब ये जो बॉक्स बन जाता है सिंपल सिंपलेस्ट केस में इसमें अगर एक डायरेक्शन को हम एक वक्त में कंसीडर करें तो उसके पैरेलल जो दीवारें हैं मेजर फोर्स तो वो कैरी करेंगी और वो अपने प्लेन में ही कैरी करेंगी और ये बात आपकी दुरुस्त है कि इनिशियल पीरियड में जब अटके की फोर्सेस बहुत हाई नहीं है और अपनी पीक पे अभी वो नहीं पहुंची तो वो रेजिस्टेंस ऑफर करती रहेगी खतूसन सैंड के केस में लेकिन वक्त के साथ यकीन जैसे आपने भी सुझाव किया वो छोड़ देंगी लेकिन मैं आपसे मुत्तफिक हूं मैंने यहीं से आगाज किया था 
کہ اس کا آئی افیکٹیو لینا شاید جائز نہیں ہے اس کا آئی گراس کے قریب ہی ہوگا مومنٹ آف مشیا آئی اگریو اور پرٹیکولرلی اس لیے بھی کہ وہ اسکویٹ ہے exactly sir because basically uh, most of the uh, loss in flexural stiffness comes from the strain penetration effects jo ke wall ke aate hain footing ke sath jo ke aur ye jo spot walls hoti hain you know they won't take it primarily in flexure as you said they'll primarily take it in diagonal compression yes, so to to wo usme mere khayal se nahi aayega ye wala factor sir ڈاکٹر completely i mean what they were discussing so i had to give them the time so the question is doc sir if no stiffness modification factors apply to basement walls then maximum base shear wall will be taken by basement walls along the length of the earthquake load applied so this is what actually um, this is close to whatever is happening actually i i always correct myself when i say this is actually what is to to get uh, so but this is in the basement floors is being carried to, uh, to the foundation through the retaining walls and there is actually a name for it it's called uh, backstay effect you know at at uh, your base level uh, your diaphragm uh, carries most of your uh, shear to your retaining wall and the retaining walls carry it to 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 the raft and that's how it is thank you doc sir i hope shafiq sir the question is answered so i don't see any more questions nor any hands raised so i think we can now conclude this uh, webinar uh let me check make it sure there are no further questions so your facebook is clear actually we don't have any further questions okay so doc sir thank you very much a very difficult subject a very difficult topic and uh, you just explained it very in a very simple way and uh, this is the, i mean this is the topic it is, it is itself a very difficult one so usko we can we to simplify it to the extent possible and i hope uh, lady and gentlemen you have learned a lot from this lecture which dr sahab has delivered today he was very kind enough to come to our platform and uh, deliver this lecture this one thank you very much for your contribution my co-host dr riyaz akhtar who is always on standby in case something wrong happens at my end thank you very much for coming to the lecture and remaining on standby to resume my duties if something happens and i would like to thank my colleagues here also sadia navid and hasnan they had they are doing a wonderful job to uh, make this transmission trouble free smooth and uh, uh and on, on the facebook too this transmission is going on the facebook so we have some problems there but uh, hopefully inshallah next time that would be resolved so dr saab thank you very much again and uh, let me make some announcements the next lecture is on uh, 13th august 2022 the topic is ground improvement in belarus our speaker is tatiana tranda she is from belarus and inshallah taala she will be with us on 13th august and i uh, i would request all of you and others also to join us 
on 13th August. It's, it's, it's a lecture related to geotechnical uh, engineering. Uh, the, your, your certificates uh, would be ready. Uh, those who are registered for this, uh, uh, for this lecture, they, will, they can collect their certificates on Wednesday, 20, 20 July, 2022 onwards from 148D Fesseltown Extension, telephone 0347 and the contact person is, uh, contact person is uh, Ahmed Akram, Mr. Ahmed Akram. And for your convenience, I will just share the screen so that uh, the people can note from where you can, can uh, uh, collect your certificates. This is, we are there. This is the all information. So Dr. Saab, again, thank you very much. Audience, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Saab, your certificate and your shield, inshallah, will be delivered at your office or at your home, whichever address is with Ms. Sadia Nabi. She will, inshallah, send it by the special messenger or by courier mail. It will be with you in the next few days. Thank you very so, much, Dr. Uh, Tahir Saab. Uh, may you have... Uh been kind enough and Rizwan Saab and everyone else to invite me to this forum. I'm uh, always glad to contribute. Um, and by the way, an outstanding effort by all of you guys. Um, so thank you very much for your invitation and I hope I was uh, able to contribute. No, it was an excellent lecture. I really, uh, I enjoyed it very much and I learned also and I'm pretty sure the audience must, must have learned also. So thank you very much, G. And uh, uh, I will, G. Doctor, please uh, go ahead. Uh, no, no, sir. I have one thing to ask. Ke ye jo certificates hain, ye email pe ya via courier ni deliver ho sakte jo wahan se pick na kar sakein. You have to contact um, Mrs. Sadia Naveed. Uh, there is a certain uh, courier fee which you have to deposit in PSC's account. Then it can, it will be couriered to you. It is a certain fee that you have to. Otherwise, uh, uh, they would be available uh, from our office at 148 Fasel Town. Courier, you have to uh, deposit a certain fee. Contact I mean, uh, it's a printed document which I have signed and uh, the, the, there's another person who has signed it. So you, I think uh, you need the uh, original one that is more authentic for you. So it's better that you uh, collect it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jeet. Okay, Jeet, with us, with this, uh, uh, we come to the end of this session and I will see you now on 20th July, uh, sorry, 13th August uh, in the lecture number 45. Thank you very much. Allah Hafiz. Take care.